Welcome to another video. I want to use this integral as a very easy example of how to use the gamma function for some definite integrals that you would otherwise not be able to compute if you just use the knowledge you get from calculus too. So, there's nothing much to do other than to transform this to make it look like what you can use the gamma function for, for and the answer is just going to show up. Let's get into the video. The starting point of any problem like this is you knowing what the gamma function does and what it, what it looks like. So this is it. So we know, let's write, recall. Recall that the gamma of x is basically the integral from zero to infinity of t to the x minus one times e to the negative t um, dt. So the integral is a function of t. But if you want to take the gamma of any number, it has to look like this. So your mission is to write this to look like this integral. What can we do? How can we transform this to this? It's easy. As you can see, the gamma function contains e. So you want to look at this and say, how can I write this in terms of e? And that's it. Once you're able to start that way, you'll be able to do this. So what I'm going to say is, what is the, just like you're doing a u substitution, if I was to do a u substitution for this integral, what would I take as my u? It is better for you to take, you can take all of it, if you can do the algebra, but it's just better to take natural log of 1 over x. So let's do that. So we're going to say, let t be equal to ln of 1 over x. And what it means is, e of both sides, e to the t, will have to be, remember, if you put this as e, is just 1 over x. So clearly, we can see this implies that if you flip both of them, which is e to the negative t, will be equal to x. So we have established that x equals e to the negative t, just by doing the substitution. And this is all we need. Because now we can replace dx from here. We can say that dx, if you take the derivative of both sides, you have dx will be equal to negative e to the negative t dt. And that's it. Remember that every time you do a u substitution or what we call change of variable like we did here, it is important to also change the boundaries. So you have to look for the best expression to use for your boundaries. Because now, oh, this is a good one to use. Because this might be confusing or confusing, but now from here I can say when x is 0, when is it possible for an exponential function to be 0? Well, it is if, you can see this is 1 over e to the t. So this is 1 over e to the t equals 0. Well, the only time this will be equal to 0 is if, let's, let's make this x because we're going to use it again. So the only time this is going to be 0 is if the denominator is infinity and that's all, that only happens when t is infinity. You see that? So we can say that x equals 0 when t is infinity. That's it. So we can go back and say that, where is it? Um, t, t evaluated at 0 is infinity. Okay, we we'll just write it that way. And we say that t evaluated at 1 will be, so we go back here. When can this be 1? This is equal to 1 when the top is 0. So it means t evaluated at 1 is 0. Okay, so we can go ahead and write this integral, let's call it i, and say that i is now equal to a new integral which goes from infinity to 0, goes from 0 to 1, this goes from infinity to 0, and now what do we have? We have the square root of natural log of 1 over x 
Well, the square root of this will be the square root of this, which is t to the one half. So that means this is going to be t to the one half. That's it. So this whole thing is t to the one half. And what is dx? dx is negative e to the negative t. So times negative e to the negative t dt. And we can take care of this minus sign by bringing it here. But we can also flip this so that the minus sign cancels the minus that would have been generated from the flip. So that gives us the integral from 0 to infinity. We've taken care of this minus sign. You have t to the 1 half. You have e to the negative t dt. Beautiful. Now compare what I just generated with the definition of the gamma function. What do you see? So from here, we can say that our x minus 1 equals 1 half. So this implies x minus 1 is equal to 1 half, which implies x equals 3 halves. 3 halves. Or we can say that x is 1 half plus 1. Mmm, nice. The reason why it's important for you to know, let's write it as 1 half plus 1. Now, the reason why this is important is that from, from the Gaussian integral, we know that, remember, that the gamma, and in previous videos that I've done also, I did this, that the gamma of 1 half is the square root of pi. As a calculus student, you have to know this. If you're using the gamma function, this, this, this always comes in handy, very helpful, because then you can manipulate whatever you get, starting from gamma of 1 half, okay? Now, how do we get the gamma of 3 halves? Because this is 3 halves. So we know, also, you need to recall this, that the gamma of x plus 1 is equal to x times the gamma, not square root times the gamma of x. You have to know that the gamma of x plus 1 is basically x times the gamma of x. Okay? It's from the definition of the factorial. So that's what we're going to do here. The gamma of 1 half plus 1 is basically 1 half times the gamma of 1 half. So we know that the gamma 1 half plus 1 is this integral that we have here, 0 to infinity of t to the 1 half e to the negative t dt. So what we're looking for, and that's what we call our i. So basically i is 1 half times the gamma, so used to the radical sign, gamma of 1 half which is equal to 1 half times the square root of pi, which is equal to the square root of pi over 2. That is the integral that we were supposed to evaluate. Never stop learning. Those who stop learning, stop living. Bye-bye.